my inclination to aid others is both a blessing and a burden. Despite the melancholy of the situation, I resolved to assist my close friend, recognizing that if not me, then who? However, this act led me to uncover a troubling secret about my wife, leaving me in need of assistance myself. The revelation was unforeseen. It fell upon me to select the venue for our Friday afternoon strategy session, and I chose my preferred Hungarian eatery, craving their delectable racket crumply. For those unacquainted with Hungarian cuisine, racket crumply is a savory concoction of layered potatoes, bacon, eggs, and sausages. Major's rendition is unparalleled, having sampled numerous versions over the years. As the six of us from the imagination team at Isaac's Forsman Marketing settled at our table, drinks in hand, Bob Isaacs, our team leader and the managing director's son, commenced proceedings with his customary folder and legal pad. Every Friday afternoon, we dedicated two to three hours to reviewing project progress and planning for the future, fostering unity and momentum for the week ahead. This tradition, upheld for nearly three years since Bob assumed leadership, correlated with a remarkable surge in our success rates. While Bob's initial ascent may have been attributed to his surname, his subsequent achievements genuinely endeared him to the team, reflected in our substantial earnings growth. About 45 minutes into our meeting, I happened to glance toward the far corner of the restaurant, a popular spot for couples seeking privacy. Marcy and I had previously requested that table. Let's leave it at that. Without a doubt, I was thoroughly bewildered when I spotted the woman's silhouette at the table, despite her face being linked to that of an unfamiliar man who clearly wasn't her husband. Laura Whitecliffe, my wife's closest friend and colleague for the past 22 years, was unmistakable. My mind raced with shock. Until that moment, I had always assumed Laura stood faithfully by the Mother Superior at our local Catholic church. Summoning all my willpower, I managed to avert my gaze from the couple and refocus on my meeting. I desperately hoped Laura hadn't noticed me yet, as I doubted she would have remained in the restaurant, let alone engaged in whatever it was she was doing. I felt my cheeks flush and beads of sweat forming as I glanced over, repeatedly catching glimpses of them kissing and him affectionately rubbing her arm. After enduring about ten minutes of the uncomfortable sight, I conjured up a believable excuse to leave early. Thankfully, Bob, in his kindness, let me go. Driving home felt like a blur, my mind racing with the dilemma of how to break the news to my wife about her best friend, Laura, being seen kissing another man at the restaurant, potentially signaling an affair. Arriving home just past three o'clock, I calculated I had a couple of hours before my wife returned from her job as an assistant vice president at Wells Fargo Bank. I changed into more casual attire, opting for jeans and a t-shirt, and poured myself a shot of Casamigos tequila. Taking a sip, I chuckled at the memory of their somewhat ridiculous advertising campaign. My mind naturally drifted towards marketing strategies. One notable aspect of their commercials, of course, is the involvement of George Clooney as a co-owner of Casamigos. I understand that the guy is a ruggedly attractive type, but it seems to me that the advertisement is targeting women more than men. Historically, women haven't been big consumers of tequila compared to men. Even with George endorsing the product, I doubt it will attract many more female buyers. That's just my opinion. Time will tell if I'm right though. I usually am. Just my two cents. I was on my fourth shot, lost in thought, when I heard my wife coming through the garage. Unlike usual, I didn't immediately greet her, which made her look concerned as she entered the family room. Oh no, she said, Helly, are you going to tell me we need to talk? Marcy, we do need to talk, but not for the reason you're thinking, I clarified. Her head lifted from its slumped position, and a glimmer of optimism flashed in her eyes. We're fine, as far as I'm aware. This discussion isn't centered on us, I stated. She let out a long sigh, raising her eyebrows before shrugging. Then who is the topic of conversation, she inquired. Laura. Laura Whitecliffe, I replied. Hard to believe, isn't it? I observed as my wife nearly tumbled off the sofa. It seemed she was completely unaware. Her expression of surprise quickly morphed into one of anger. All right, spill it. This better be worth it, 
or you'll be sleeping on the couch for a week, she threatened. I recounted to her what I had observed earlier at the restaurant, including my speculation that engaging in affectionate behavior might not necessarily imply she was involved with the unidentified man, although it could be a significant clue. Admittedly, Laura wouldn't, would she? She's your closest friend. You understand her much better than I do, I remarked. I took a sip of my tequila. Marcy simply stared at me for a moment, her expression was inscrutable. So, what's the plan? I inquired. I assume you'll want to take the lead on this. Whatever we decide. Yeah, yeah, I'll handle it. No matter what we decide, she affirmed. This time it was my turn to arch an eyebrow. So, judging by that expression, I gather you're not planning to inform Tim? I inquired. Why would I? You're uncertain about what you saw. How could we even approach this? I'd rather not disrupt their marriage without a clear understanding of the situation. We need to take action somehow. We might not know the full extent of this, but what I witnessed certainly raises doubts about Tim's fidelity, I countered. You're well aware that if I told you Tim was kissing another woman, you'd rush over to support Laura in confronting him. I'm much closer to her than to him. You know that, she remarked. Nevertheless, it doesn't justify her actions. At the very least, you should talk to her, listen to her side, I insisted. But I can't just accuse her without evidence, Marcy argued. I'll need to handle it more tactfully than you would. I'm curious to hear her justification for exploring someone else's oral cavity, I remarked. On both Monday and Tuesday, Marcy didn't mention anything about Laura to me. So, on Wednesday night, after putting our daughter Rose to bed, I asked my wife if she had spoken to Laura yet. She stumbled over her words for a moment before changing the subject, effectively ending the conversation. I decided to let it go for the night, but the next evening, I practically confronted my wife, insisting that we have a conversation about it. Listen, if you don't want to confront her, I'll do it. After all, I'm the one who saw Laura I'd be again no no please don't do that I'll talk to her tomorrow Marcy responded I had been with my wife for a long time and I could sense when she was reluctant to do something I started feeling uneasy about the entire situation. I need an answer, darling. If you're too scared to confront it, I'll just talk to Tim. If she's cheating on him and he finds out that I knew something and didn't tell him, he'll be extremely angry, and rightfully so. I know we're not as close as you and Laura but he's been my friend for many years, and friends don't keep secrets from each other. If my wife were cheating and I discovered a friend knew about it but didn't inform me, there would likely be consequences, and our friendship would be strained. You just don't betray a friend like that. I explained, Marcy looked visibly shaken as I spoke. She promised to talk to Laura the following day and provide an update. I didn't realize it then, but the following day marked the beginning of the end for my marriage. At that time, however, I became aware of a problem for the first time. When Marcy returned home the next day, she wasn't entirely forthcoming. In fact, I was fairly certain she was hoping I wouldn't bring it up. Finally, after Rose had left to spend Friday night with some friends, I confronted her about it. She feigned forgetfulness. Laura explained what happened. It's not exactly as you thought, Norm, but she admitted to crossing a boundary with a guy named Kenneth Atiner. She assured me it wouldn't happen again. She claimed she just lost control of herself. If Marcy could have met my gaze while speaking, I might have believed her explanation. Instead, she avoided eye contact altogether, glancing at my waist, over my shoulder, anywhere but my eyes. Throughout our 22-year marriage, she had never averted her eyes, even when confessing to wrecking my beloved 2015 Mustang Shelby GT500. I suspected Marcy and Kenneth had spoken, but I dismissed the idea of any connection, considering it mere nonsense. Marcy, however, seemed complicit, covering for her friend and deceiving me outright. In all our years together, this was the first time she had lied to me knowingly, leaving me devastated. In the following days, I grappled with the reason behind my wife's deception, finding no solace in any explanation. A few days later, Bob Isaacs asked me to meet with him alone in his office. 
that's a polite way of saying I was being called in to discuss a mistake I made. It's not something that happens often to anyone on our team, but when it does, Bob handles it well by keeping the conversation private and not publicly reprimanding anyone. After some small talk, Bob asked, What's been happening, Norm? You seem distracted, and your performance has been off for a few days. I informed Bob about Marcy's recent deception regarding her friend's potential affair, expressing uncertainty about how to proceed. Bob, looking earnestly at me, proposed the idea of hiring a private investigator to look into Marcy's friend. It's about finding peace of mind, Norm. You can dwell on this or confront it head-on, find out the truth, and move forward, he advised. I know a guy who's reasonably priced and can provide answers quickly. What's your plan for this? Will you inform your friend if it turns out his wife is cheating? Because if you do, remember the risk of being blamed for the message. What if he gets angry at you, even if his wife is unfaithful? That's a valid concern, but wouldn't I be failing as a friend if I didn't tell him if she is cheating? I pondered. You'd either be the best kind of friend or the biggest fool, Norm, he remarked. The following afternoon, I met with Roy Hoover, the private investigator recommended by Bob. Two weeks later, I obtained proof that Laura Whitecliffe was indeed being unfaithful to her husband. It was time for me to take action. However, what I was not willing to do was inform my wife, who seemed to be covering for her closest friend. Much to my disappointment, I likely had a better understanding of Laura than Tim did because she had worked alongside my wife for 20 years, so I had heard numerous stories about her over the years. Essentially, I knew Tim through his wife, just as he knew me. He seemed like a decent guy, a bit uptight perhaps because of his engineering background. We had a good rapport, being avid sports enthusiasts. The four of us shared a comfortable camaraderie. We shared many common beliefs particularly valuing marital fidelity, or so I thought. Roy Hoover shattered that illusion. As for my wife's stance, it remained uncertain. I phoned Tim, arranging to meet for lunch the following Tuesday. I considered Monday, but Mondays were already dreadful, and I didn't want to add more misery. This meeting was bound to be unpleasant. I requested a secluded table from the waitress to ensure some privacy. I opted for a double tankery on the rocks while Tim chose a dark craft beer from the selection of 16 on tap. He had a penchant for craft beers. As he approached our table, a nervous grin spread across his face. Beer already here? Things must be pretty dire, he joked. Who's the unlucky one, you or me? You, I replied with a sigh. We placed our food order, and as soon as the server departed, I broached the difficult topic. I hate to break it to you, Tim, but your wife she's cheating on you, I said. I'm telling you because you're my friend, and I'd hope a good friend would do the same for me if my spouse were cheating, rather than letting me remain oblivious. Tim's expression twisted with discomfort. A tear trickled down his face before he turned aside. Damn, he murmured. I had no idea. How did you find out? Did Marcy spill something? I mirrored his grimace. I had not sure how to break this to you, but I'm pretty certain Marcy has been protecting her, I admitted, unable to meet his gaze. A few weeks ago, I witnessed something that raised suspicions, and when I confided in Marcy, she initially downplayed it. Then, she claimed she would talk to Laura when she returned. She relayed Laura's version, insisting Laura admitted to some indiscretion but hadn't she eat it. Marcy had never deceived me before but I sensed she wasn't being entirely truthful, so I conducted my own investigation. I don't throw friends under the bus. We allowed the waitress to serve our food. My stomach was churning nervously, and his must have been in turmoil by now. How long has this been going on, and with whom? I'll make him pay, I swear he's finished, he growled. I can't say for sure how long, but the person is Kenneth Attenborough. I witnessed them kissing passionately at Majar three weeks ago. At the time, I didn't know who he was, but the private investigator I hired proved invaluable. Here's the dossier he provided, along with a USB stick containing photos and a video, I replied, pushing a sizable envelope across the table to him. 
He gingerly opened the envelope, ensuring no sensitive material was exposed to other patrons. I observed a mix of anger reconvulsion and sorrow wash over his face damn so you hired a pie to spy on my wife why would you do that I mean thanks I guess but that must have cost you a pretty penny I had strong suspicions that your wife was cheating on you but I couldn't tell you about it without concrete evidence you're my friend that's what friends do I explained he lowered his head wearing an inscrutable expression damn it damn it he muttered I. I'm sorry, Norm. I suppose I'm not half the friend you are. I have to admit, I lost my composure. Damn it, are you kidding me? I shouted, leaping from my seat. She stay calm, Norm. Sit down, he urged, attempting to quiet me. Glancing around, I noticed all eyes were now on me. I raised my hands in apology, and most people returned to their own conversations. I resumed my seat. Speak, I whispered, trying to keep my voice down. Based on what you've just shared, it seems our wives have been covering for each other. That commitment to fidelity that we all thought we had agreed upon appears to have only been upheld by you and me, he said. I found out about Marcy six months ago. Laura told me she had been involved with some guy she met at a bar about a year ago. When I discovered what Marcy was up to, Laura pleaded with me not to tell you, and foolishly, I agreed. I'm sorry, Norm. So you're telling me my wonderful wife has been involved with someone else for the past year and a half? Did you catch his name? Is it still ongoing? I fired off questions. Yeah, about a year and a half, and from what I understand, it's still happening. I occasionally overhear bits of their conversations on the phone. Laura doesn't feel the need to be as secretive around me anymore now that I'm aware. She mentioned his name is Bill Goland. I believe he's a junior executive at a tech company near where the girls work. He and some of his colleagues have been spotted several times at the bar where the girls often go for drinks after work. I was doing my utmost to refrain from yelling or hyperventilating. How had this day taken such a disastrous turn for me? So I suppose we're both in a tough spot, metaphorically speaking, of course, Tim remarked. I signaled the waitress for another round of drinks. I phoned my office and informed Bob Isaacs that I was dealing with a significant personal issue and would be absent for the remainder of the day. Tim also called his office and decided to take the rest of the day off. Next, I contacted Roy Hoover and assigned him additional work, with Tim covering the expenses this time. Sounds fair, mate, Tim nodded. Two weeks later, I received my own set of documents confirming what Tim had told me. During these two weeks, I'd been thinking about what went wrong in my marriage, that Marcy felt the need for another man. Two decades later, the discovery of Marcy's infidelity was painful. But looking at the photos was like a dagger to the heart. The most painful pictures were those in which she looked at him with such adoration. It was obvious that their relationship went beyond mere physical intimacy. If we talk about physical intimacy, there was no evidence of it during these two weeks of waiting. Despite Marcy's attempts to initiate me, I refused her on various pretexts. Although, to tell the truth, the thought that my wife was with another man simply haunted me. I didn't just wait around for evidence to magically appear. I took action, meeting with my lawyer to handle the usual financial matters. As soon as I received the envelope containing the evidence, I was prepared and promptly sent Marcy to court. Living in a faultless state, I refrained from explicitly citing adultery as the grounds. This seemed to bewilder my unfaithful wife. Why, darling, what's happening? She tearfully inquired when I answered the phone about five minutes after she was served. Do you really need to ask? Two can play at the game of deception, Marcy, I replied calmly. You've been cheating on me for over a year. Did you honestly believe you could get away with it indefinitely? There was silence for several tense moments. Then I heard her exhale heavily. I was planning to inform you soon. I simply wasn't prepared yet, she said. What the hell, Marcy? How much longer did you need before you told me? I interrupted. A year and a half. You're right. I should have told you earlier, she acknowledged. I wasn't seeking it out, nor did it just happen. We have a connection. I'm in love with him. He's my soulmate. Oh, well, 
There you have it. He's your soulmate, I mocked. I remember when we had a connection. I remember when you were in love with me. I remember when I was your soulmate. Damn it, woman. I'm sorry, Norm. I should have been more straightforward with you, she said, ending the call. Well, that went smoothly, I thought to myself when I entered the room. Marcy put on the table a large pizza from my favorite takeaway place. She was pouring herself a glass of wine, and I took a beer. I wish we could have talked about this sooner, I said. She blushed with guilt. It's not your fault, Norm. It's all because of me, she confessed. I was in love with you for a long time. So he just replaced it in your heart. Was it before or after you ended up in bed? I retorted. Oh, Norm, did you have to do this? I was hoping that we could handle this as adults, she complained. I'll try to be discreet, Marcy, but it's not easy for me. Just like it wasn't easy for you to remain faithful, I replied sarcastically. She looked shocked, tears welling up in her eyes. I noticed her take a deep breath. I think I deserve it, she admitted. Yes, you did, I said harshly. Seven months later, Marcy and I became part of the divorce statistics. We sold the house, and my share was ample for a substantial down payment on a three-bedroom condo just 15 minutes away from my office. According to my daughter, Marcy moved in with her significant other. Our daughter Rose was about to embark on her final year of college. Despite her discontentment with our divorce, she endeavored to comprehend the situation. But if she no longer loved you and found love elsewhere, the divorce makes sense to me. Everyone deserves to be with the one they love, Dad. Hopefully, you'll find that someone someday, remarked Rose. I thought I had found that someone when I married your mother, I grumbled in response. I never anticipated being replaced. I don't recall our vows including a clause for substitution. I noticed her eye roll, yet she wisely chose to withhold her thoughts. Likewise, I refrain from expressing what might occur if Rose were to experience a similar situation in the future. For the first six months following my divorce, I didn't make any attempts to start dating again. Unlike some acquaintances, I didn't prioritize satisfying my physical desires. I always believed there was more to life than just sex. While I didn't openly announce my divorce, I was open to discussing it if it came up in conversation. Over time, I noticed an increase in the number of single women crossing my path. It seemed ironic to me when I was in my 20s, finding dates was a challenge. Now, in my 40s, women were showing interest in me. After about a month, I discussed this observation with. Norm, let me tell you something, you're a catch. You've got looks, fitness, and a solid career that makes you quite the catch. Plus, there are more single women our age than men and many guys in their 40s are too busy chasing younger partners. It's a limited pool out there, he explained. I hadn't quite seen it that way, I replied. For the next six months, I made it a point to get out there every weekend. I've dabbled with both younger and older partners. One encounter with a 25-year-old left me physically spent the next day, she joked about pills for that. On the flip side, my experiences with 55-year-old women have been more gentle on both body and ego. As my second Christmas post-divorce approached, Bob entered my office looking uneasy, shutting the door behind him before taking a seat across from me. What's on your mind, Bob? I inquired, um, Norm, are you bringing a date to our company Christmas party next week? Bob asked tentatively. I mean, I know you've been dating a lot lately and you're always welcome to bring whoever you like, I observed beads of sweat forming on Bob's forehead, unsure where this conversation was leading. I hadn't planned on bringing anyone again this year, I responded cautiously. Why do you ask? He let out a sigh, appearing so distressed that I began to fear he was about to disclose a serious illness or something similarly dire. So, you know how my wife is this unstoppable force of nature, and she's a bit of a meddler who thinks she knows what's best for everyone, right? Well, she's really adamant that you should consider dating her old college roommate, Lainey. Lainey's been divorced for a while now after being cheated on, and Marilyn believes you two would hit it off perfectly. I understand I can't force you to agree, but if you don't, 
Marilyn will make my life a living hell. So what's the deal with this lady? Does she have two noses or something? I joked. No, nothing like that, no physical abnormalities. She's a really nice person, he paused. There it is, I interrupted, the classic great personality, that's code for not so great looks, you know. No, seriously, I promise she's not unattractive, and she truly does have a wonderful personality. Please, Norm, please, he pleaded. I chuckled, seeing him wince, aware of his wife's beauty. Okay, count me in, but Marilyn better owe me big, I declared. Deal, he agreed, suddenly looking much healthier than moments before. Now that I've willingly signed up for this, give me the lowdown on Miss Personality at least, I prompted. He spent the next two minutes detailing my mystery date, 5 feet 8 inches, around 130 pounds, with long blonde hair cascading down her back, a former NCAA Division I volleyball player on scholarship. She remained in shape even after childbirth. As an actuary with an insurance company. She was both intelligent and detail-oriented, an intriguing combination. With all these qualities, why is Marilyn trying to set me up with her? I questioned. You know my wife, she can't resist. She truly believes you two would hit it off perfectly, he replied. The Isaacs Forrester Christmas celebration was always opulent, featuring live music, appetizers, prime rib, and a speech from our CEO, Philip Isaacs, Bob's father, and various commendations. It maintained a formal atmosphere, with men in their finest suits and women in elegant gowns or dresses. Philip Isaacs's wife, Fee, meticulously managed every detail, ensuring a top-notch affair. I arrived at Bob Isaacs's residence to pick up my date, feeling reminiscent of a nervous teenager on his inaugural outing. Marilyn greeted me at the door with a kiss on the cheek, welcoming me inside. As Bob approached, I couldn't help but smile awkwardly. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Isaacs, and yes, I promised to have her home at a decent hour, I quipped, knowing Bob would catch on to my apprehension. He returned my grin, clearly ready with the retort, don't make me come looking for you two in my car, young man, he countered, and we shared a knowing smirk. At that moment, my date made her grand entrance, and let me tell you, it was quite the entrance. She confidently walked into the room wearing a form-fitting turquoise gown that cascaded to the floor, accentuated by a daring slit running up her impeccably toned left leg. Her hair was elegantly pulled back into a high ponytail, cascading halfway down her back, and her eye makeup accentuated her stunning azure eyes. Oh, and did I mention her luscious full lips? I attempted to speak but found myself utterly speechless. Well put, Norm, Marilyn purred, causing my cheeks to flush, as Lainey and I entered the party room together. Heads turned, and I knew it wasn't solely because of my new Armani suit. Philip and Fee Isaacs greeted us shortly after our arrival. Lainey, darling, it's wonderful to see you again. Are you spending time with the children? Did you bring your son along? Fee inquired. Norm, I hope you don't mind if I steal your date for a moment, I grinned as Philip warmly clasped my hand. Having worked under him for 18 years, our connection surpassed the typical employer-employee dynamic. I regarded him as a surrogate father, with my own father passing away two years after joining Isaacs Forrester, Philip became the person I turned to for paternal guidance. He and Fee had kept in touch, especially when they learned of my struggles with Marcy. Despite not explicitly discussing it, I knew they were aware of my dating history post-divorce. We've known Lainey nearly as long as Marilyn, Philip remarked. It's heartening to see her with a decent guide, assuming you're one, his use of son didn't escape me, implying a deeper connection. Absolutely, sir. I can't predict what'll come after tonight, which Marilyn orchestrated, but I'll certainly be respectful. You can trust me, I assured. I do, Philip affirmed. I'm glad we're on the same page. Lainey and I spent the majority of the night together, delving into our life stories leading up to that moment. She possessed a graceful dancing style, and I particularly cherished the slow dances where she seamlessly melded into my embrace. Throughout the evening, she was approached by several other men inviting her to dance, yet she always looked to me first. Although I didn't want her to dance with anyone else, 
we lacked a defined relationship, so I felt unable to object. However, she seemed attuned to my feelings and declined all offers from others. The night was lovely, concluding with a passionate kiss at the Isaac's doorstep. I had her input her number into my phone during the ride home. Still parked in the Isaac's driveway, I dialed her number. So, what's your plan for tomorrow? I inquired. I had to give credit to Marilyn, she was spot on. Lainey was the perfect match for me, and we hadn't even slept together. During our first five dates, that happened on the sixth date, and it was incredible for both of us. I had no clue how long it had been since Lainey had last been intimate with someone, but she responded enthusiastically when we began kissing on the sofa in my apartment after a night of dinner and dancing. I wasn't exactly Fred Astaire or Gene Kelly, but my ex-wife enjoyed dancing, so I picked up enough to hold my own. Who would have thought that skill would come in so handy in my life? Certainly not me. But on that particular night, Lainey seemed more than a little excited when we left the club and headed to my apartment. That night brought an extraordinary intimacy, and I came to realize she was a genuine treasure. As we embraced afterward, she gazed at me with a perplexed look. What on earth? she exclaimed. Everything was amazing, and then it's like I zoned out or something. I wasn't present, and then I snapped back. It's bizarre and incredible. I grinned widely, exceedingly so if I'm being precise. Mentally, I congratulated myself. You're amazing. I exclaimed ecstatically. Maybe we can do it again sometime, but not today. I don't think I can handle it anymore, she quickly replied. Your wish is my command, I assured before leaning in and giving her my most passionate kiss. Two weeks later, I encountered Lainey's 13-year-old son, Tsin, who affectionately referred to Bob and Marilyn as uncle and aunt. He was notably impressed by my skills in tabletop hockey, foosball, and frisbee. It seemed evident that his father didn't allocate much quality time during visitations. Initially reserved, he found me on the first day. By the end of the second day, Tsin was following me around like a loyal companion. Well, on top of all your other talents, you never mentioned you had a knack for captivating kids too, she remarked. I adore children. I would have had four myself, but my ex wasn't keen on more after our first. I disclosed, we initially agreed on two, but she went back on our deal, often reminding me of the physical sacrifices she made. Yet, she was a devoted mother to our daughter. I can't fault her parenting. In fact, I couldn't fault her as a spouse until near the end. Based on what you, Bob, and Marilyn have said, she seemed like a decent woman once. What changed? inquired Lainey. I'm still not entirely certain. From what little she disclosed, it all started innocently, but somehow she developed feelings for him. As she grew distant from me, she even called him her soulmate. Her loss might gain. Let's move on from her now, Lainey urged. Six months later, she said yes to my proposal and changed jobs to be closer to me. We started searching for a house together. I popped the question to Lainey on a Saturday. The following Monday at work, Bob strolled into my office with a huge grin. All right, all right, Marilyn was spot on, I admitted to Bob, who sat across from me looking smug. I concede her rightness. What's the catch? You've got that look on your face, I asked. No catch, just be a good stepdad to my favorite nephew, Bob said. Consider it done, I replied. A week later, Bob and I were unwinding with drinks at a serene pub after our shifts. Our friendship had grown considerably since I began dating Lainey. Glancing up, I spotted Tim Oakliffe seated at a nearby table, accompanied by a striking young woman in her mid-twenties. The last time I crossed paths with Tim, roughly a year ago, he and Lore were striving to salvage their relationship. Evidently, their efforts had fallen short. Hey there, long time no see, how have you been? I inquired as I approached his table. I noticed a flicker of discomfort in his expression as he caught sight of me. It was clear my approach marked the beginning of the end for both our marriages. Hello, Norm. How's everything going? He responded. Can't complain. Didn't mean to intrude, just wanted to say hello, I reassured him. 
No intrusion at all. By the way, this is Anna McGill, a friend, he introduced. His impassive demeanor suggested the young woman in her twenties was merely a companion. Anna, meet my friend Norm, the man who turned my life upside down, Tim said. Anna appeared stunned. Tim observed her expression and realized he needed to provide a condensed explanation, at least the abridged version. It was his private investigator who caught my ex-wife chief, and then I informed him about his own wife's infidelity, and the rest is history. He divorced his unfaithful spouse. I attempted to reconcile with mine. You can see how that turned out, Tim elucidated. He shifted his attention to me, offering a lopsided smile. I'm not sure if she resumed her relationship with her boyfriend, but I discovered they had reconnected about a year after all this began. Can you believe that? He inquired. He inquired about the recent events in my life, and I mentioned becoming engaged to Lainey. The way you left things, I thought you might never tie the knot again. She must be an extraordinary woman to mend the wounds Marcy inflicted, he remarked. She truly is exceptional. You're right, I affirmed. I'm sorry it didn't work out for you, Tim. Truly? Well, if you're getting married again, I suppose that closes the door on your ex, then, Tim remarked. I gave him a puzzled look. I thought I'd close the chapter on Marcy when we got divorced. Didn't you hear? Seriously, he asked. Heard what? I asked. Marcy's lover left her. Didn't your daughter tell you about it? It seems that the idea of kindred spirits was not mutual. She wanted commitment for a while, he preferred to consider other options. She mistook it for love, he thought it was just physical intimacy, he explained. I wonder why Rose didn't mention this to me. Even though I'm not particularly interested in it anymore, I remarked. When I found out, I honestly thought that she would contact you, try to make peace. I bet Rose told her about your engagement, so she didn't bother. All things considered, I have to say that I am incredibly lucky. Lainey and I had a relationship that was probably even deeper than Marcy and I had, both emotionally and physically. Then there was Scene. He swiftly transcended being just my stepson, he became my son in every aspect except for his surname. Despite maintaining a close bond with his father post-divorce, we forged our own strong relationship. Even though he cheered for the Chicago Cubs and I for the New York Yankees, we found common ground by supporting each other's teams when they weren't in opposition. Given they played in different leagues, when Laney and I purchased our house, it boasted four bedrooms. The master suite occupied one end of the second floor, featuring an ensuite bathroom, while another bedroom at the opposite end had a smaller bathroom with a shower. Though it could have served as an ideal guest room, it was never a consideration that it wouldn't belong to scene. Any lingering doubts we might have had about assigning him the room vanished when he noted that the separation would help dampen the noise from our room to alleviate some of the embarrassment from his statement. Come on, Mom, I'm 14 years old. Do you really think I'm oblivious to what you guys will be up to in your room? He remarked. This is all you're doing, Laney insisted. He's been spending too much time with you. Rose instantly took a liking to Laney when they met, even before I proposed to her. I could sense a hint of jealousy from Rose about how close seen and I had become. You finally got the son you've always wanted, she said to me, her tone carrying a bit of tension. It's wonderful to have a son, Rosie, but you'll always be my little girl. Your place in my heart is irreplaceable. Seen has simply found his own space, I reassured her. We embraced tightly. I'm so happy you found someone, Dad. I was worried you'd be alone forever, she whispered. Although I never inquired, Rose kept me informed about her mother's activities. According to my daughter, Marcy dated numerous unsuitable men, most of whom were at least ten years younger than her, and some were even within the age range of men my daughter might date. Rose jokingly mentioned to Lainey and me that she hesitated to introduce men she was dating to her mother for fear that Marcy might try to seduce them. Rose tied the knot two years after I married Lainey. Her husband was a hefty fellow who had spent a few years playing in the minor leagues of baseball. After leaving baseball, he utilized his business degree to secure a job in finance. Like Seen and me, 
we connected over our love for baseball, despite his allegiance to the Atlanta Braves. When the three of us were together, things could get heated pretty quickly, prompting. Laney and Rose too often opt for shopping outings, while the three guys watched a game. Rose cautioned me that Marcy would be attending the wedding accompanied by her fiancé, Larry, a banker in his forties. He's quite a smooth talker, Dad, but I suppose she's taken with him. I trust you'll keep your composure, even if he gets a bit too much, she remarked. As long as he doesn't go too far, I responded. Rose had Larry pegged, he had a slick manner but knew where the boundaries lay. I could sense Mar's apprehension that he might test my patience, as she never left us alone, always lingering nearby whenever we conversed. As the father of the bride, I financed the wedding and ensured that Rose had everything she desired. Over the years, I had achieved considerable success at Isaac's Force & Associates, though the name had undergone some changes as I became a 10% partner several years ago. Philip Isaac and Jack Forsman had proposed adding my name to the firm's title, however, I believe that Isaac's horseman possessed a strong brand identity and preferred not to alter it significantly, I didn't see validation for my ego since I was footing the bill. I indulged myself with a small treat towards the end of the evening. I unveiled a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle Special Reserve 12-year-old bourbon for my table, which now included Phil and Bob, Isaac's Jack Forceman, my new son-in-law, and Larry McIntyre. I proposed the toast. Larry murmured something to my former spouse as we sipped our bourbon, and for the first time that evening, he appeared impressed. A bit later, Marcy pulled me aside to express her gratitude for hosting such a splendid event and for including Larry and the pappy. Norm, you must be doing quite well judging by tonight's expenses, Marcy observed. I've been prosperous for a while now, even back when we were married. You probably didn't notice much, being preoccupied with your soulmate. Frankly, I'm not sorry it didn't work out well for you. Maybe Larry will be a better match. Marcy did marry Larry, but their union ended in divorce less than three years later. As for Rose, last I heard she was mostly alone, occasionally seeing an elderly suitor and playing bingo at her church every week. My relationship with Lainey kept getting better over time, and Rose and my son-in-law blessed us with two grandchildren. Sean joined Isaac's Force Man Associates after college and tied the knot two years later, adding three more grandchildren to our family with his wife. Laney and I extensively discussed becoming empty nesters, eventually deciding to buy an RV and travel the country while still enjoying time at home, working, and spoiling our grandchildren. It's been ages since I last saw Tim Whiff. I hope everything worked out for him. Thanks to everyone who tuned into today's tales. If you enjoyed it, consider liking and subscribing. And if you haven't already, share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.